Hey everyone, back here. We'd like to give a quick shout out to our sponsors, INI eLearn Security, Axonius, MongoDB, and Juniper Networks. The Diana Initiative 2021 wouldn't be the same without you, and the Career Village thanks you for your sponsorship. Next up, we have Megan, Megan Daldelin. She is a cybersecurity instructor at INI. Let me pull this back here so I won't be looking to the other side. Okay. Living and working full time on the road in an airstream with her, her husband and two dogs. Meg started her career as a defense contractor performing digital forensic analysis in the DC metro area after completing her bachelor's at Chapl Champlain College. Upon deciding to return to New England, Megan accepted a role as the network security analyst, analyst for a small region hospital. She was then recruited to join Tenable as a content analyst and developer creating user-friendly plugins for Tenable Security Center. While at Tenable, she completed her master's at Chaplin College and began teaching there as an adjunct professor. Meg was then recruited to join Circadence as a platform training developer and later became lead of the curriculum development team, coding and creating new training materials for the gamified cybersecurity training platform called Project Ares. Megan then accepted an opportunity to work as a, a strategic, strategic consultant for FireEye Mandiant in order to support clients in their efforts to elevate their security posture. Sadly, we had a, a few technological bumps in the road. We had a few glitches. Megan won't be live with us, but there is a recording we're going to give you now. Thank you all for being here. Thank our sponsors. Thank all the attendants. You have made this an incredible event. I'll see you around. Thank you. And here's Megan. Of course, for attending this wonderful event. Hi, everyone. Let me start by saying thanks for tuning in. I'll admit that as many times as I've imagined my first conference talk, it never looked quite like this. That said, I have a lot of appreciation now for what we've learned about virtualizing opportunities like this, and I hope we can carry these lessons forward into the future even when we can be back in person. I think hybrid events will only improve participation and engagement by increasing accessibility. I also want to thank the organizers of the Diana Initiative for putting on such a fantastic event, as well as the sponsors for seeing and backing the vision. A particular shout out to my employer, INE, for being a diamond sponsor and supporting me in my topic of choice, even though it has little to do with my job or their offerings. Now to introduce myself, my name is Meg Dodlin, and I've been in the industry for a bit over nine years. I started my career in digital forensics, and to me, that really is an important piece of context for this conversation. While the forensic analysis I was doing had technical components, the majority of the effort and its value was in the analysis, weaving together bits of data into a comprehensive story about each user. I adored that work, making data make sense first to myself and then to others through my reporting. But then life happened, and I had to find a new role in a region without many forensic jobs. And that's when I first ventured outside the forensic subdiscipline into the broader world of cybersecurity. Over the next several years, I hopped from enterprise security to security content development to a sort of CTF engineering role to curriculum design to security consulting. Point is, I've dabbled in a bunch of areas within cybersecurity. And yet, I would never describe myself as a technical person. And before you awe and think I'm being self-deprecating or underestimating myself, like others have when I've said, I'm not. A long time ago that I'll never be a technical person, 
I'm simply not here for the tech. I'm not a hardware collector. I don't mess with software or networking in my free time. I've never done a techie competition on my off days. Tech is not my hobby. But when I first started college, I got the impression that it had to be. All my confident peers seemed to be into that part of things. And the fact that I was consistently top in our classes didn't spare me from feeling foolish when they'd bring up some new gadget I had never heard of. And when we talk about technical people, you all know who I'm talking about, or maybe you are one. When a colleague asks about them, everyone says, oh yeah, they're so good or at this hardware and this software. They write this language faster than I've ever seen. They play CTFs on the weekends and have gotten six certifications this month. Their home network is defended by three firewalls and they perform vulnerability scans every night. They have a server rack in their basement with liquid cooling. And here I am just hoping that's still a thing. You know the ones. We love them, we need them, but we can't all be them. And I'm not them. Trying to be them, to fake that love of technology, has only affected me negatively in the past. Nothing gets my imposter syndrome nagging faster than trying to be someone I'm not. I considered quitting my undergrad program several times, crying on the phone to my mom more times than I could count. It took me a while to realize that I don't even want to be that person. I'm happy to use my technical skills however needed and to learn more, more of them. But those aren't the skills that fulfill me, that make me feel worthy and successful. Every job I've had has required me to learn a new set of technical skills. But at the end of the day, those are not what have made me an effective or appreciated employee. And now you're all wondering, so what is she good at? Well, honestly, many of the skills I now hold most dear are things that I saw as weaknesses or that I tried to hide in the past. My almost annoyingly analytical and critical mind allows me to see the gaps and ask the questions that others don't. My extracurricular experience with writing and public speaking allows me to communicate with anyone regardless of their technical know-how. My innate self-awareness that sometimes still simmers over into self-doubt allows me to appreciate and leverage the brilliance of my colleagues. Who I am inside, who I am despite years of technical training, is what makes me successful. And maybe some of these soft skills resonate with you. Or maybe you have other ones. Maybe you are a project management superstar with an immutable knack for keeping track of components and dependencies. Maybe you inspire teams with your quiet leadership everywhere you go, just establishing communication and building trust. Maybe you can't help but make others feel more confident and capable, improving your colleagues' performance just with your presence. Maybe all your friends and colleagues turn to you for career advice because you have a way of cutting through the wishy-washiness and seeing their core needs. Maybe they all come to you when things go wrong because no one can break down a problem and move forward better. Maybe you're the go-to sounding board because you can listen and reflect without judgment or imposition. All of these and so many more are examples of where our non-technical skills are what make us invaluable. And then there's all the non-technical skills that act as buzzwords in job descriptions, but are never adequately measured or evaluated. How many times have you read the job description that gets posted for a new member of your own team only to think, well, I don't think they need to know all that too many times. Yet so many of my friends and colleagues over the years have acknowledged that they would always rather work with someone who is eager and adaptable, resilient and curious, respectful and collaborative than someone who knows something. And yet for all the interviews I've been part of as either the interviewee or interviewer, questions about those skills just get awkward. So when have you faced a challenge at work and how did you handle it or what did you do about it? Is that sub question supposed to provide an adequate answer into my potential? Why aren't we finding better ways to lead that conversation, to understand a person's core potential, to understand the gaps they could fill on a team or in an organization? But here we are. Technical skills have long been the focus of training and development programs within cybersecurity probably because they've always been the metric by which candidates and employees are evaluated. 
non-technical skills are all but overlooked during the hiring process, simply glossed over in the job description and hardly mentioned during interviews. To be fair, technical skills are easier to evaluate. They can be yes or no questions, or perhaps a scale from beginner to expert. They can be readily compared in a quantitative manner. Non-technical skills are incredibly subjective, yet in workplaces around the world, they're what make the difference between acceptable and exceptional. Teams that learn how to leverage and empower people for their non-technical skills are the ones that surpass expectations. Teams that don't feel it. Being measured by, evaluated against, valued for skills that I don't enjoy using has contributed significantly to periods of discontent. Being in that situation leaves me feeling drained, just dragging myself along. And I started hearing the same from friends and colleagues once I started opening up about it myself. This disconnect can leave people in technical roles feeling not quite right. It's that feeling that leads to bringing up the job boards three, six, 12 months into a new role. It's what happens when the facts of the role or the culture just don't line up with our true selves. Sure, sometimes it's the technical skills or opportunities that make a person leave a job, but in my experience, it's more often been a disregard for the pieces of self that really make an employee unique. That's what leaves them feeling out of place. I'm not suggesting that it's possible to always love a job. However, if the role aligns to who you are beyond your technical skills, the days at least won't be dreaded. There is significant opportunity in our field to enhance recruitment and career progression efforts by looking at all the non-technical skills that a role or a team requires and understanding an, un and an understanding of team dynamics and non-technical skill gaps can assist in finding employees or opportunities that provide the greatest sense of satisfaction. Truth be told, a readjustment of this type is also likely to improve diversity and inclusion in hiring. As a byproduct of growing up in modern society, women develop many skills that men simply aren't required to. We naturally become better communicators and collaborators, tend to be better at maintaining objectivity, and more easily understand the connections between individuals, teams, and projects. Why aren't technical roles hiring for these skills, the ones that are harder to teach? Technology can be taught, but many of the non-technical skills are about who we are rather than what we know. It's time we're all encouraged to be proud of these skill sets and that training and development in these areas become a normal part of per career progression for all employees. From there, job descriptions and interviews can genuinely focus on a candidate's potential and the unique gaps they could fill on a team, rather than a list of awkward questions like, have you handled this technology before? We all know that years of experience don't translate directly into effectiveness, especially in an industry that evolves as rapidly as cybersecurity. Sebastian Ramirez succinctly summarized this shortcoming last summer when he reflected on Twitter that he had seen a job post requiring four or more years of experience with fast API, something that he didn't even have since it had been less than two years since he created it. There's already some progress trending in this direction. Multiple technology companies have publicly stated that they'd be removing degrees from their job requirements. And that's great because we all know that a degree and capability don't always go hand in hand. But now it's time to start moving away from being overly specific with the technical skills and job descriptions and instead evaluating technical knowledge against a baseline of minimum requirements. Job requirements should be the minimum necessary to be successful, not everything the employer hopes and dreams of finding in a unicorn. Because yes, the company may be using one technology today, but that might change tomorrow. Sure, maybe they're a Juniper shop today, but what happens when a project to replace it with a Cisco infrastructure gets approved? Employers already expect us to adapt and learn to keep pace with the industry and with organizational decisions. So why not recruit based on those skills, the skills that bolster a team, that enable efficiency and effectiveness? Having the opportunity to use and develop those skills, the ones that make each employee uniquely themselves, that improves job satisfaction and workplace culture, which in turn reduces turnover. Those are the skills I want to be interviewed about. Those are the skills that should set candidates apart.
But change can be slow. So what do we do in the meantime? How do we emphasize our greatest assets while the tide is still turning? Before we can do that, we need to understand what our innate strengths are. What skills make us unique? What skills fulfill us? It can also help to understand what conditions we're most effective under and how to adapt any role requirements to fit ourselves. Long before I got started on my rambling road into cybersecurity, I held one of my favorite jobs. For several summers, I waited tables. I loved that work and have always said I would enjoy doing it again. It wasn't until recently that I gave much thought to why. What I figured out is that I felt incredibly functional in that environment. It turns out I am a task and objective oriented person. Waiting tables is perfect for me in that way. Clear tasks, clear outcomes, clear deadlines. Working in ambiguity is exhausting to me. I like order and structure. Recognizing this about myself gave me back some power. I could start applying structure to an unstructured work environment, even if just for myself, making me more effective and more productive. Onto my professional career, I've already mentioned that performing digital forensic analysis is where I got my start. When I considered why I enjoyed that work so much, I realized that it let me be the processor that I am. I got to take vast amounts of disconnected information and tie it all together into a cohesive story. I also got to share that story, turning chaos into value for others. That same concept echoes in my teaching and technical editing. As both a professor and editor, I get to take complicated concepts and help them make sense to others. I get to use my skill at seeing others' perspectives to determine whether a particular explanation or definition or paragraph will make sense to them. I can see when things are jumping too far ahead without laying the necessary foundation and help fill those gaps. But when you're trying to better understand yourself, don't limit your thinking to the workplace. Sure, those were some examples of responsibilities or roles that really let me shine, but there are also plenty of examples outside of work that speak to who I am. I adore reading fiction, often going through at least a few books a week. My all-time favorite author is Stephen King, not for the horror, but for the complexity. I like having to figure things out, to see connections between discrete information. The way Mr. King's anthology can be tied together one book after the next lets me find my way through a new world. My interest in certain video games trends in the same direction. I'm awful at combat games, but I love an immersive world with complexity and its own set of rules and a unique history. I believe this speaks to my resourcefulness and creativity. I thrive on innovative solutions that ask what if, while not losing sight of the problem or the objective. I'm the one that wants to understand the status quo well enough to apply thoughtful change that won't have unexpected consequences. I also love to cook. What's more task and objective oriented than a recipe? It gives me a clear list of resources, steps, time to complete and expected outcome. And then on top of that foundational layer of following instructions comes the opportunity to get creative, to wing it. It's everything education is supposed to be, crawl, walk, run, layering knowledge and skills and past experience into something new. Now I lucked into some of these realizations and even then it took me some time to figure out, to understand how these concepts of myself could be reflected in my work. How to find roles or teams that not only let me be myself, but wanted to leverage me for those aspects of myself that had nothing to do with my technical skills. I want to encourage everyone here, regardless of where you are in your career or life, to give yourself the opportunity to reflect on who you are and what brings you contentment. What in your life, past or present, has let you lay down at night with a calm mind? What adequately exercises your mind, flexes your innate strengths, such that you feel content and fulfilled at the end of the day. And whatever answers you come up with, try to boil them down further. We can't all read books or play video games as our job, so we need to understand what it is about those fulfilling activities that makes them fulfill us. From there, there's opportunity to start applying your strengths to your current roles, as well as pitching them in future interviews. Knowing your innate strengths can give some context to what is or isn't working well for you in a role. And understanding that can let you either buckle down and endure 
or find a way to adjust the situation to fit yourself. In my experience, it can be easier to survive a less than ideal role than to land a new one that's better suited. There's lots of great advice out there to help you land an interview by improving your resume or leveraging colleague referrals. But what about during the interview? How can you handle questions that might not be directly related to your strengths so that you still come out looking like a strong candidate? For me, this was a challenge I had to overcome quite early in my career. My technical knowledge was limited when I was looking for my first role outside of digital forensics. So I really had to emphasize my other skills. There were plenty of interviews that did not go my way, but the thing that resonated amongst all the interviews that felt successful was my ability to focus on my non-technical skills. Even with a technical question, if I didn't know the answer or wasn't familiar with the topic, I very intentionally said that I didn't know, but then also voiced my eagerness to learn and drew connections to similar technologies or concepts. For example, in the interview that landed me my first job outside of forensics, I relied heavily on relating cybersecurity to digital forensics. I emphasized how my experience analyzing hosts and networks from a forensic perspective prepared me to detect anomalous behavior that could be indicative of an intrusion or infection. I didn't have actual experience doing intrusion or malware analysis, but I certainly knew what a healthy state looked like. I got to focus on my adaptability and my ability to apply related concepts to a new problem. So when you're preparing for your next interview, especially if the requirements or responsibilities are on the fringes of your experience, think about how everything you've done or learned, how everything you are applies to the role. Maybe you've never been a SOC analyst, but you have an eye for anomalies and you excel at data refinement. Maybe you're in IT wanting to move into something more security centric. And sure, you don't have experience with security automation, but you've been scripting automation for your current job for years. Women in particular are prone to seeing a list of job requirements as a Boolean argument. All truths mean I'm qualified, but any falses mean I'm not. Which is why there's opportunity for us if we can get past the literal interpretation of job requirements to understand the non-technical skills that would make someone successful in the role. From there, we can tailor our resumes leverage our colleagues and sell our uniqueness in interviews. We'll always be more successful and more fulfilled in a role that resonates with our true selves. So let's use those innate strengths to find roles on teams that will love us for them. And that's what I've had on my mind, especially as I've been acclimating to a role that wants me to be more visible and to share more broadly. My first reaction when that idea came up was, but I don't have anything to talk about. It took some reflection to realize that I made the assumption that I had to be talking about tech to bring a valuable perspective, to share a useful story. But that's not who I am. So instead, I'm sharing something meaningful to me that I hope will become a bigger conversation. I hope something here has resonated with you, and I would be so glad to hear your thoughts or your reactions. If you want to drop me a note or tell me all about your strengths, Les, thank you so much for joining me today and, of course, for attending this wonderful event.